If I asked you to describe Breaking Bad's Walter White, a whole host of words would spring to mind. Ambitious, intelligent, logical, emotional, selfish, sick, brave, ruthless, relatable. But if I had to sum up the essence of the character in one word, it would be manipulative. Although we see his humanity and understand his rationale, there's no one more dishonest, desperate, or despicable than Walter White. There's almost no low he will not stoop to, always putting his own ambitions above everyone else. Writer Vince Gilligan was tasked with somehow keeping the audience on Walt's side, as he transforms into the most effective but least moral version of himself. Realistically, how could such a physically weak, dying man credibly become the leader of a criminal underworld without being a master of manipulation? Knowing which emotional lever to pull and when, with an intuitive grasp of how to play the opponent in front of him to get the results he wants. So let's examine how Walter White lies and manipulates everyone over the course of five seasons of Breaking Bad. If we start with his home life, there are several manipulative tools Walt uses to get what he wants. The first is basic, keeping secrets. This is something we all do to some degree. We all have secrets that we either keep entirely to ourselves or that we only share with those closest to us. It's a defensive instinct, as on some level we understand that certain sensitive information can be weaponized against us. Information is a precious resource, and by withholding it, Walt always gives himself the upper hand. The first person Walt starts keeping secrets from is his wife Skylar, by not telling her that he's been diagnosed with lung cancer. Although you could say he keeps the secret, so he has time to process this life-changing news, the scene directly after his diagnosis highlights an ulterior motivation. Did you use the MasterCard last month, uh, 1588 at Staples? Walt, the MasterCard's the one we don't use. The simple act of nagging him for using the wrong credit card suggests that Skylar is locked into her way of doing things, and subtly controls everyone in the house to obey her system of rules. But by withholding information, Walt is giving himself more freedom and space to figure out what he wants to do without anyone else's opinion influencing him. Then when he goes on a ride along with Hank, he spots Jesse as the suspect they're looking for, but chooses not to tell his brother-in-law, as this opens up the opportunity to partner with Jesse. So right from the beginning, the writers establish that every time Walt doesn't tell everyone the truth right away, he only strengthens his position, and becomes more empowered to make decisions for himself. But of course, withholding information can only get you so far. Sooner or later, if you want to keep your secrets, you're going to have to start making up lies, which is the next step on the sinister ladder of manipulation. Walter White is an exceptional liar because he understands that the best lies are based on the truth. If all the details of a story are questionable or unprovable, then the lie can easily fall apart. But if large parts of it resemble provable reality, then the missing link in the story is harder to disprove. For instance, in the second episode, when Skylar suspiciously asks Walt who Jesse Pinkman is, he's initially weak and starts trying to pretend he doesn't remember him. Then once she shows her hand that she already knows he called this morning and even labels him a druggy burnout, he has to come up with a story on the spot. Now he could manufacture something from scratch, but instead, Walt uses the information she already has to piece together a simpler lie. He sells me pot. The reason the lie works so well is that he's playing into Skylar's expectations. She wants to scold him for something, so he gives her what she desires by confessing to something much smaller than the actual crime being committed. Her negative reaction then justifies why he kept it a secret in the first place, solidifying the false narrative as the truth in Skylar's mind. It's also drug-related, which is in line with the limited information she has of Jesse, and can explain away any of Walt's future odd behaviour. Now Skylar can think her husband is technically involved with drugs, as a user of something as petty as pot, which keeps her mind far away from the idea that he's a manufacturer or dealer of something as ominous as meth. 
To seal the deal, he further cements the lie by never retreating on the back foot, but instead going on the offensive. He geniusly closes this alleged confession by turning it back on Skylar. Will you please, just once, get off my ass? You know. By making it seem like she's the one in the wrong for even complaining about his minor infraction, it makes his lie more believable and causes her to be less likely to complain the next time she's suspicious. And Walt knows there will be a next time. So once he's cornered and can't deny it, he creates a lie that's based on the truth, confesses to a lower level crime than he's guilty of, and turns the tables on the interrogator so that they feel ashamed for even asking. Another example of Walt using the truth to bolster a lie is when he pretends to be going to see his mother for a weekend to tell her about his cancer diagnosis in person, when in reality, he's going to the desert to cook up a huge batch with Jesse. In this situation, the truth is he should be going to spend one-on-one -on -one time with his mother, even though he isn't. So he's sort of preying on Skylar's humanity, as there's no way she can possibly say no to a terminally ill man wanting to spend time with his mother. So Walt identifies what the right thing to do is and uses it to shield him from doing the wrong thing. Like how Walt tells Skylar that Gretchen and Elliot are the ones paying for his cancer treatment, because she already knows they offered to, and if we're being honest, he realistically should have let them. Show over. He always keeps track of the information his opponent has, so he can weaponize it against them. Then when he gets busted and has a bitter argument with Gretchen over involving her in his lie, here's how Walt handles the fallout. Skylar tells him that Gretchen called, and he says nothing. He withholds information as he's waiting to see what she knows. He never shows his hand. And he's lucky he didn't, as it turns out Gretchen only told Skylar they're no longer going to pay for his medical bills, but she didn't rat him out and reveal they never had in the first place. Naturally, Skylar is suspicious and asks what happened earlier. So Walt now has to come up with a reason that Gretchen is cutting off funding after their private conversation together. Rather than making it something personal that Skylar might want to follow up on, Walt claims that Gretchen and Elliot are secretly broke, and that Gretchen simply had too much pride to admit it to Skylar's face. That's a plausible lie, as Walt knows that people do behave this way, given he had too much pride to ever take their money in the first place. So he transfers his truth onto someone else and stamps the narrative. Another example is how Walt preys on his victim's fears to misdirect them. When he accidentally lets it slip that he has a second cell phone, he of course denies it, assuming that's all the information that Skylar has. But on the night he disappeared before his fugue state, she saw him look worried, receive a call, and leave the house. When she checks his phone records, he never received a call, so that's enough to convince her that Walt is lying about his second cell phone. So how does Walt try to manipulate her out of the clear evidence for her suspicions? And I think what you heard was my cell phone alarm going off. He continues to deny it, constructing a plausible lie that his phone alarm that he's been using for his medication sounds similar to his ringtone. This is a smart initial strategy, as if she's not that invested in her initial suspicions, then he's offering her an easy excuse to believe. But when she's still not buying it, he then diverts her attention away from his deception by validating her earlier suggestion that he should go back to the cancer support group meetings. You know, for what it's worth, I, I was thinking about going back to those meetings, the cancer support group. Uh, you, were, you were right on the money about that. So he's using the truth to build a new narrative, as these cancer support group meetings do exist. But notice how he's manipulatively rewarding her for her recommendation, so she can't say no when really he's just creating more opportunities to lie about where he's been, as now he can always claim he was at one of her suggested support meetings. When Skylar remains cold, still not buying his lies, he tries a new approach to emotionally unlock her. A showcase of vulnerability. He apologizes for being so private and unavailable, saying what he thinks she wants to hear. I love you. And I love this family. And although that successfully pulls Skylar in, she's still not quite convinced, so he turns the tables and plays the victim. God, how long are you gonna do this? Do what? This! Not, not talking to me! 
Imagine being on the receiving end of this. He's giving you so many social cues you would normally follow. He's ticking the boxes of taking responsibility. He's technically being vulnerable. He's creating new narratives that you'd prefer to exist in. And when you don't give it to him, you begin to doubt if you're the bad guy. This is all gaslighting. He's making you doubt if you're the problem in a toxic scenario that he's actively creating. When she still doesn't break, he reaches even deeper, finding a new fake narrative to mislead her down the wrong path. I have no idea, Skylar. What, that I'm, I'm having an affair? Is that it? Is that what you think? Is that why you asked me about the some other phone? There's a stroke of genius to this manipulation, as he's now putting the focus on a crime he's not guilty of that he knows he can disprove. It's also the crime he's statistically most likely to be committing. But when she refuses to play into his false reality, and insists he tells her the truth, no matter what it is, he gaslights her again by holding the line. Tell you what. This puts the pressure back on her. If she has any lingering doubt whatsoever about her position, then she's very likely to turn on herself. Everything Walt is doing here, to his own wife, is the most sinister form of emotional abuse imaginable. Which leads directly onto the next step on the dark ladder of manipulation. Close the loop. A big part of deceit is storytelling, and Walt knows that a good story always needs a resolution. When someone comes to him with a problem, a concern that's flaring up in his face, their mind is panicked and in need of certainty. So Walt always makes sure he creates a narrative that has a positive resolution, so that way the loop in their mind can close. For example, when Hank shows Walt Gale's lab book in season 4, Hank identifies a clue, the initials WW, that could cause him to speculate whether it's Walter White. So Walt closes the loop by finding a quote from Walt Whitman's poetry on another page and cementing the idea that he is the WW in question. Hank was living with this burning question mark in his mind, and Walt intelligently extinguished those questions with a solid answer that directs the attention away from him. Another example in Season 4 is when Skylar calls in to discuss the car wash. Walt says he doesn't want to talk about it, concealing his black eye. Once she sees it, she naturally worries for his safety and wants to go to the authorities, so Walt reassures her that he was just in a small bar fight with a co-worker, but that the fight was actually the best thing that could have happened. May have been a good thing, actually, because we were able to clear the air and, you know, mutual respect. And... So after reframing his black eye as a positive, when Skylar asks him to promise that if things do get dangerous, he will go to the authorities, he agrees as a way to silence her concerns and then deflects back to her topic of choice. So... Car wash. So he ends the conversation on a high, rewarding her for believing his story by giving her the car wash discussion he originally denied her. Like a magician, he's putting her attention back where he wants it, and now that she gets to discuss this topic at length, she'll forget all about her original concerns as he closed that loop and redirected her mind back onto her topic of preference. All of these techniques allow Walt to be in complete control, so that when the time does inevitably come that he has to tell the truth, rather than giving the full story, he can trade them an old piece of information to get them off his back. Hearing just part of the truth will feel like a revelation to the victim, but unbeknownst to them, it actually places them two steps behind him. They're always chasing to catch up with what's really going on, as Walt is the only one with all the information. Let's take a look at some examples. In season one, when Walt gets busted by Skylar for lying about working late at the car wash, when in reality he quit his job days ago and has been cooking meth and even killed a man, that string of lies has run out of space to maneuver. He's going to have to tell her something to explain all of his strange behavior. But because Walt has been withholding information, he gets to choose what level of power she has in the dynamic by not giving her the full story. So instead he tosses her some old news, revealing that he has lung cancer, as that information is big enough to distract away from everything else. He even goes back to that well and pretends that he was in a fugue state to explain his disappearance. 
Think of each lie like a credit card that's racking up debt. And then once it maxes out, he pays it off with a new line of credit that an old piece of truth can pay for. Then in season four, now that the money is rolling in, Walt and Skylar have to come up with a compelling story to justify their newfound financial security to Hank and Marie. The narrative is that Walt learned how to count cards and has made a huge amount of money from secretly gambling. From Hank and Marie's perspective, they now have two big pieces of information, the cancer and the gambling problem, which can explain away most of Walt's suspicious behavior. If he shows up with bruises, he's back in trouble due to gambling, and if he's acting strange, it's the cancer again. By confessing to sinister but legal ways of making money, rather than selling a traditional clean success story, the listener is more likely to feel in the know and appreciate being confided in. We see this again in season five, when Marie is demanding to know the full truth as to why Skylar is acting so erratic. Walt could choose to continue the gambling narrative or the cancer narrative, but both of those narratives place the blame on him where it realistically belongs. So instead, he selfishly trades some of Skylar's dirty secrets to undermine her reputation. He explains that Ted Beneke had an accident and may never walk again, and Skylar must be upset because she had an affair with Ted. Yet again, this slyly paints Walt as the victim of the situation, and although Marie came in expecting him to be the bad guy, he turns the tables, and she's now hugging the perpetrator of her sister's abuse, providing him the emotional support that Skylar desperately needs. This is Walt's signature strategy, always drop a bombshell of juicy information to deflect away from any wrongdoing. This way the victim of the lie, Marie, now feels like she's been confided in and is up to date, when in reality, she's still two steps behind. But these manipulative tactics are mostly what Walt employs in his home life. When it comes to his work life, where he faces hardened criminals and balances on the edge of life and death, he plays it differently. Given Walt does not possess physical power or working knowledge of traditional weapons, he initially needs to make people believe he's more dangerous than he really is, which is highlighted by his joyful description of the blowfish. Okay, the blowfish? puffs himself up four or five times larger than normal, and why? Why does he do that? So that the other scarier fish are scared off. You see, it's just all an illusion. It is. It's nothing but air. Being a blowfish is essentially bluffing. It's making others perceive you to have more in your arsenal than you really do. So once Jesse is perceived to have squashed a man's head with an ATM, Walt uses other criminals' perception of Jesse to justify expanding into new territory. When your opponent fears you and believes you're more capable of psychopathic behavior than they are, they're more likely to fold and give you what you want. We see this again in the final episode, where Walt manipulates Gretchen and Elliot into finding a legal way to give his drug money to his kids using nothing but laser pointers, as at that stage, the world's perception of Walt is that he's a hugely well-connected kingpin, when in reality he's acting alone and his cancer is back, so this threat is completely hollow. But Walt isn't above using force via threats and intimidation. Given he felt as if he's been scared and out of control of his whole life, he now asserts control over everyone around him, coercing them to do what he says or have their life or reputation ruined. This happens in the very first episode. Despite how their relationship develops, Jesse never chose to cook with Walt on his own volition. Either that, or I turn you in. Tuco only does a deal with Walt because he threatens to kill everyone in the building, including himself. Saul Goodman only becomes their lawyer because Walt and Jesse take him out to the desert at gunpoint. When Saul wants to stop working with him because he poisoned Brock, Walt intimidates him into continuing their relationship. When Hank reveals he knows he's Heisenberg, Walt tries to threaten him into submission. Maybe your best course would be to tread lightly. And when that fails, he makes a fake confession video, alleging that Hank is the real corrupt mastermind behind his meth business. As always, this communicates, do as I say, or your life as you know it will be over. There's no clearer form of manipulation than threats and intimidation. 
and over the course of the series, as his crimes grow in scale and viciousness, his threats only become more credible. If he can't have what he wants, he'll take you down with him, making complicity the safest option and the path of least resistance. Another manipulative tool Walt uses is to turn your weakness against you. If he has something he knows about you, or knows he can do to prevent you from getting to the truth, or position you where he needs you to be, he will always act on it. We see this consistently with how he keeps Hank at bay throughout the series, always using his loyalty against him. When Hank is watching the bench so that Badger can sell to the fake Heisenberg, they need to block his vision, so Walt uses himself as the perfect distraction by parking next to Hank and acting oblivious as to what's going on. The reason this works is that Hank has always looked down on Walt and views him as out of place in criminal situations. So by playing it so dumb, he feeds right into Hank's weakness and confirms his bias. When Hank has Jesse and Walt locked in the RV with nowhere to hide, Walt knows the one thing that will manipulate Hank away, the one thing he values more than catching Jesse. He has Saul's assistant call in a fake report from the hospital to inform him that his wife has been in a car accident and is in critical condition. When he needs to bug Hank's office, he uses his macho bravado against him by breaking down emotionally, trusting that Hank will be too uncomfortable at the sight of tears that he'll have to leave the room, giving Walt his opportunity. And when Hank asks Walt to drive him to the industrial laundry where his lab is hidden, in order to buy time, Walt uses Hank's trust against him and crashes the car, putting him in the hospital. Knowing Hank will forgive him and dismiss this accident as a brain fart, or suffer a concussion and forget what even happened. In a way, he's punishing Hank for underestimating him, for thinking so little of him, for pitying him. He feeds into Hank's bias and exploits it time and time again, for personal gain. Which leads on to the next step of Walter White's ladder of manipulation, leverage. By identifying who has what level of power in any given situation, based on both people's emotional needs and preferences, he puts himself in a prime position to play puppet master. We see examples of this peppered throughout season three, when he leverages Skylar after she kicked him out of his own home. He initially moves back in without her permission, causing her to call the cops. That's her big play, hoping seeing the man in blue will scare him off. But given the deeds are in his name, Walt legally can't be kicked out unless he's physically hurt her or is actively committing crimes. So she technically could spill the beans and win, if that's what mattered most to her. But it isn't. Walt knows that more than anything, Skylar doesn't want their family's life destroyed. So once she starts being pressured by her own son naively turning against her, she folds, and Walt is allowed back in temporarily. Then later in the season, she persuades Walt to buy the car wash to launder his money legally and hire her as his bookkeeper so that their story is consistent and inconspicuous. But by pressing Walt to do this, she's yet again showing her hand. He can see that Skylar is clearly willing to incriminate herself to keep the family safe. She's already lied to Hank and Marie about how Walt got the money in the first place so that she could pay for Hank's rehab, so she's implicated no matter what. Therefore, Walt now leverages her guiding motivation against her to negotiate his way back into the house four days a week, as well as having his own key. I am going to be a part of this family, and that is how we'll sell you a little fiction. She now needs him just as much as he needs her, so she's forced to negotiate. When it comes to the criminal underworld, the stakes are higher, but the same principles apply. By making himself the most valuable asset in the game, he's too necessary to lose, which gives him the power to negotiate and keep himself and Jesse alive. He needs me. And if he doesn't go, I don't go. You kill me, you have nothing. You kill Jesse, you don't have me. Walt will do anything to hold on to his leverage, even if that means killing someone else. When it comes to Gus Fring, Walt understands the pragmatism of the man in front of him, so always plays to those needs. Whereas Jesse has an unspoken leverage over Walt, without him, he's alone in this game and can be easily manipulated. 
So when Jesse wants to wage war with Gus's men, knowing he risks getting killed, Walt intervenes and does it himself. When Gus is furious about this decision, Walt presents the only two options. You can kill me right here right now, with ease, in the middle of nowhere, and cease manufacturing. Or you can forgive this act, and let me keep making you money. Again, Walt uses the information he already has on Gus to manipulate him. He previously praised Gus for cornering the market and wiping out his enemies. But that means Gus needs to capitalize now. Everything he's worked for can be won or lost in these coming months. So his choices are only to pragmatically keep Walt alive or squander everything out of revenge. Once Gus tries to outmaneuver him by bringing Gale back, Walt's leverage is in jeopardy. In time, Gale will be able to replace him and therefore Gus will have no need for him and kill him. So Walt and Jesse plot to murder Gale so that now they're the only two cooks that can keep Gus's business running. Walt didn't just have this leverage, he created it. He forced it into being so that he can manipulate the only other person with more power than him. Walt and Jesse have one of the most fascinating relationships in television history. A father-son teacher-student dynamic in which they save each other's lives, hate each other, and get rich together, while constantly flipping between rivals and teammates. But there is no greater victim of Walt's manipulation than Jesse Pinkman. Let's take a look at the different mind games, emotional abuse, and coercive control that Walt exercises over his apprentice to keep him in line. After learning from Gus that he can never trust a junkie, Walt makes it his business to get Jesse clean. So after their biggest payout to date, Walt refuses to give Jesse his cut until he stops using drugs, as he believes that if he's in possession of this much money, he would be dead by the end of the week. But after Jane blackmails Walt, he loses his leverage and is forced to give Jesse his money or risk being ratted out to the authorities. This places Walt out of control of his own fate, a position he cannot bear to be in. So much so that when Walt sneaks into Jesse's home later that night to talk, and accidentally tips Jane over, causing her to choke on her own vomit, he could have saved her. He could have let Jesse choose whether he wanted to be with her or not, whether he wanted to get clean or not, whether he wanted to be partners or not. But instead, Walt strips Jesse of his agency by letting Jane die. Whether his intentions were good or not, as you could argue Jane was leading Jesse down a destructive path too, Walt is being manipulative, as by not saving Jane, he's eliminating a personal threat to him, and putting himself in the strongest position to control Jesse. After finding her body, tragically, Walt is the first person Jesse calls, as he's the only person he can turn to for help, and that sucks him right back into Walt's manipulative arms. When Jesse wants to kill two of Gus's men for using kids, Walt again tries to control him by asking Saul to get Jesse arrested for something petty so that he can be off the streets for a few days until temper's cool. And when that doesn't feel plausible, he rats him out to Gus so that Jesse is forced into a situation where he has to either make peace or die. This conveniently creates a situation where Walt simultaneously scores points with Gus and reinforces to Jesse that the only reason he's even alive is because of Walt's leverage. If it wasn't for this man and the respect I have for him, I would be dealing with this in a very different way. Walt then gets Jesse to kill Gale as a form of reciprocity for him killing two of Gus's men on his behalf. Walt utilizes a fairness frame to guilt his apprentice into compliance by saying, I saved your life, Jesse. Are you going to save mine? Walt initially makes a deal with Jesse that all he needs to do is get him Gale's address and he'll do the rest. But that's not how it plays out. In the end, he's forced to pretend he's about to give Jesse up to Mike so he can manipulate him into letting him make the call, and then barks the order at Jesse to do it over and over, leveraging Jesse's loyalty to him to make him commit murder on his behalf. Do it, do it, Jesse. Do it. 
This scene right here is one of the most manipulative moments in the entire series. When Walt wants Jesse to help him kill Gus, he initially doesn't seem interested, as Gus has been treating Jesse particularly well and even rewarded him with the compliment that he sees things in him. Realizing he's losing his leverage, Walt begins a relentless, manipulative tirade. He starts off by increasing Jesse's doubt, reminding him that a month ago Gus was trying to kill both of them. He then quotes Jesse's words back to him. He says he sees something in you. What kind of game is he playing? Notice how he's framing everything Gus is doing as manipulative rather than him, deflecting away from his game by phrasing everything through Gus's perspective. The language of manipulation is so important. If Walt had just said, I think Gus is playing a game, we shouldn't trust him after everything he's done, he tried to kill us a month ago, that would be honest and not manipulative, as he would be sharing his view with Jesse and giving him the choice to respond. But instead, Walt spins it using antagonistic language. Does he really think you're that naive? This makes Jesse have to question if he's being played by Gus. He then frames each sentence as if it's an attack on Jesse's intelligence for him to think any other way, which also taps into their teacher-student dynamic. He can't truly think that you'd forget, let alone Gail, let alone Victor, and all the horror that goes along with that. So see how he's now upping the ante, slithering in under Jesse's skin as he starts tapping on all the trauma Jesse has been through, topics that are guaranteed to make him emotional. He then takes it a step further, twisting that trauma into anger, reminding Jesse of all the other times he wanted to kill. What about this girlfriend of yours and her little brother? I mean, the man looked you straight in the eye and told you no more children, but that very night, that little boy, he winds up. Then he lets Jesse's mind fill in the blanks. Dead. He winds up dead. So he's reminding Jesse of Gus's broken promises. Then he continues berating Jesse's intelligence. I mean, Gus can't possibly think that you'll forget that. All I'm saying is, is it possible that he would think you're so weak-willed? Drop the sales pitch. I'll do it. And then Jesse breaks. He poked and prodded until he got what he wanted. Rather than saying, remember what Gus did, he frames it as, Gus must think you're stupid for forgetting he did all of this which is really a way for Walt to call Jesse stupid if he doesn't go along with what he wants. Here's another prime example in season five. When Jesse wants to sell his share of the business for five million and get out, Walt throws every manipulative tactic at him to coerce him to stay. Firstly, he taps into his lack of ambition, trying to make him fearful by reminding him that being the best at something is a very rare thing. You don't just toss something like that away. This again feeds into the teacher-student dynamic, framing it as if Jesse leaves, he's squandering his potential. Walt now shifts to, to do what? Condescendingly suggesting Jesse will probably just play video games and go-karts as a way to demean any other choice Jesse might want to make for himself as a loser decision. By mentioning video games and go-karts, He's also tapping on Jesse's youth, framing it as if he's being childish to not want to do what he wants, that continuing their illegal work is the grown-up choice. As always, he now goes on the offensive, trying to wear Jesse down in the hopes that once his self-esteem is low enough, he'll break and concede. He reminds Jesse he has nothing and nobody in his life, and then stoops even lower. If you don't keep working with me like I want you to, how soon until you start using again? This is outright mental warfare now. Before, he presented it as, do you want to be a child or an adult? Now it's, do you want to be a junkie? Then after stooping so low, he takes a sharp, surprising turn and tries to reclaim the moral high ground. He alleges he's just as upset as Jesse is about Todd killing that boy in the train heist. When Jesse questions that statement, Walt turns the tables like he always does, trying to put him on the back foot. How can you say that to me? Jesus, I'm the one who's the father here. Again, using the truth to bolster his lie. Unlike Jesse, he is a father, but that doesn't necessarily mean he cares more. 
He then subtly uses his defense as another way to attack Jesse for being weak. What, do I have to curl up in a ball and tears in front of you? Do I have to lock myself in a room and get high to prove it to you? What happened to that boy is a tragedy, and it tears me up inside. Notice how he's consistently attacking Jesse's character, suggesting his way of responding to situations is wrong. Then he tries a new approach, reminding Jesse of all the terrible things they've done together, even mentioning Gail's name just to twist the knife. All of this is in service of undermining Jesse's desire to do the right thing, making that instinct seem futile by reinforcing the idea that they're already going to any hell that exists. But I'm not going to lie down until I get there. This gets a reaction out of Jesse. What, just because I don't want to cook meth anymore, I'm lying down? How many more people are going to die because of us? In this line, Jesse has shown his hand. Maybe he just needs to hear that the future is bright. So Walt ceases the opportunity to again gain the moral high ground and reframe him being in control as a positive to close the loop. No one, none. Now that we're in control, no one else gets hurt. But Jesse sees through his lies. He just wants his money and he's done. You'd think that's it. He fought hard, but Walt has lost. There's nowhere else to go. But Walt then reaches for a new manipulative tool. He turns the tables again and questions Jesse's moral integrity for even wanting the money. If he's truly so torn up inside about what they've done, why does he still want the filthy drug money? Walt won't allow Jesse this moral inconsistency. This strategy is truly dark, but admittedly kind of genius, because by taking this sinister approach and essentially robbing Jesse, he's activating the part of Jesse's brain that wants money, that's thinking about all he went through to earn it. This emotionally makes Jesse want to fight for the money, internally coming up with arguments for why he deserves it. And then after lighting that fire, Walt, like the devil himself, turns around for one last attempt to seduce him back to the dark side. You want it. You want it just as much as I want it. And it's not wrong to want it. Somehow, Jesse holds strong and leaves, but he's forced to leave empty-handed. Towards the end of the series, after killing Mike and wiping out all his guys in prison, Walt's words always have an undercurrent of intimidation. How could they not? He's proven he's willing to do anything. He's not just a blowfish anymore. When he calls into Jesse to change his mind about keeping the money, Jesse bravely tells Walt that he suspects he killed Mike, otherwise he wouldn't ever feel safe after offing Mike's guys. Walt of course flatly denies this, and launches into storytelling mode about the last time he saw Mike and how he might come back one day. But realising Jesse won't look at him, Walt states repeatedly, Jesse, I need you to believe me. This assertion is subtly coercive, as what choice does Jesse really have? If Walt is telling the truth, then Jesse has nothing to fear, in which case he can safely say he believes him. But if Walt is lying, which he is, then by insisting he needs Jesse to believe this, Jesse has little choice but to parrot the words Walt wants to hear, otherwise he risks crossing a serial murderer and his life could be in danger. So Walt is leveraging his reputation to intimidate Jesse into submission. We see a similar undercurrent when Walt needs Jesse to leave town, but rather than just telling him he needs his help because Hank wants Jesse to act as an informant, Walt treats Jesse like a fool, and starts the manipulation process to make him believe this decision is actually best for him, regardless of Hank's actions. Walt innocently proposes maybe it's time for a change, but he doesn't mean a personal change that he can make, he means a fresh start for Jesse, somewhere else, suggesting he gets out of town and doesn't look back. He starts painting a beautiful picture of a whole new life, he could get a job, something legitimate that he likes. He could meet a girl and start a family. Because Walt knows Jesse wanted all these things long before he got his hooks in him. He even tries to reframe Jesse having to abandon his hometown as an enviable position, claiming he would happily trade places to have his whole life ahead of him and a reset button, trying to present this as an enviable opportunity rather than a terrifying necessity. 
But Jesse is wise to Walt's mind games. He's seen him do this again and again and again, always putting words in his mouth. And although he will give him what he wants, perhaps out of loyalty, perhaps out of fear, he calls out Walt's lies and coercive controlling behavior. It's either this or you'll kill me the same way you killed Mike. I mean, isn't that what this is all about? Uh, us meeting way the hell out of here in case I say no? But by far the most sinister and layered act of manipulation Walter White ever commits is poisoning Brock. With nothing left to lose, Walt has to turn Jesse back on side to team up to kill Gus. So he has Saul's bodyguard steal the rice and cigarette from his pocket so that Jesse will suspect him, as Walt is the only other person who knew the ricin even existed. Then when Jesse calls to his house to accuse him and perhaps even kill him, Walt can turn the tables and make him think it was Gus. How? Well, as we've established, the best lies are based on the truth. Unlike Walt, Gus has killed a child before. That's a low only one of them has ever stooped to. When Jesse arrives, Walt appears paranoid and powerless, so he looks unsuspecting and vulnerable. If he showed any line of defense, it would make him look more suspicious. But he intentionally makes it easy so he can put Jesse exactly where he wants him. This manipulation is so high risk and layered because Walt essentially wants Jesse to suspect him. He wants him to want revenge so that he can take that murderous instinct and redirect it at Gus by creating a new false narrative for Jesse to live in, a more familiar one. He lays out the whole plan and acts like he's lost his mind at the brilliance of Gus's work, which is really him openly complimenting himself, which is something a liar would normally never do. He then cements the idea in Jesse's head by taking his first narrative, that he's paranoid and vulnerable, waiting for Gus's men to come kill him, and tying it to the current situation. I've been waiting all day for Gus to send one of his men to kill me. And it's you. He twists Jesse's current feelings of wanting to kill him, and acts like he's being engineered to feel that way by Gus, not him as he already established in that earlier episode that Jesse has many reasons to distrust Gus. He throws out possibilities to get Jesse's mind turning. Maybe Gus's men lifted the ricin cigarette off him instead of Saul's bodyguard. Maybe Gus does know about the ricin. He controls everything and there's cameras everywhere. He's using Jesse's weakness, his self-doubt, against him. He then lays out all the true pieces of the puzzle that Gus did replace Walt with Jesse as his cook, that Gus doesn't need him anymore, that Gus wants Walt gone, that Gus has been trying to break them both apart, and uses all those truths to autofill the lie, that Gus manipulated you into coming here to kill me yourself. In essence, Walt has somehow managed to weaponize his complete lack of leverage in this situation by manipulating the one person he understands the most, as Jesse never wants to kill anybody and won't pull the trigger if he has any doubts in his mind. On top of that, he intentionally didn't poison Brock with the ricin that only he could have made. He used the Lily of the Valley plant so that he could muddy the waters and have plausible deniability no matter the outcome. This allows him to turn the tables on Jesse all over again, when Jesse is already at his lowest in terms of trusting his own instincts. When they're searching for the missing rice and cigarette at the start of season 5, notice how Waltz pretends to not even know what the dust collector even is, despite clearly being the one to plant the rice in back inside of it when Jesse wasn't looking. What the hell is that? A rumba. And once his manipulative plan succeeds, Jesse breaks down in tears, devastated and ashamed, forever doubting Walt. His reaction is raw, emotional, and authentic. He believes he's taking responsibility for what he's done wrong, but in reality, he's still the victim of a lie. The victim of a man that would never take responsibility for his actions so openly. And to top it all off, the predator forgives the victim, and soothes his aching cries with a shoulder rub 
to recapture the moral high ground and further punish Jesse for ever even suspecting he could do the exact thing he did. This isn't just manipulation, it's emotional abuse. And after five seasons of watching Walter White lie, steal, gaslight, exploit, coerce, leverage, and even kill, I think it's safe to assume that he is television's darkest, most despicable manipulator of all time. Well, if you've made it this far, firstly, thank you for watching. But if you could now give the video a like, possibly even leave a comment and click on that subscribe button, it will encourage that mysterious algorithm to do its thing. 